we've talked quite a bit about uh, how Mendel's laws apply to individual crosses. We've talked about what a test cross is, reciprocal cross, dihybrid crosses, and so forth. That's all very easy as long as you have only two parents and you have lots of progeny. You can then uh, do that work. But when you start dealing with animal systems and especially human systems, uh, you can't really do that. There aren't that many progeny, and there's really only one cross most of the time. So how do you go ahead and look at what the genetics are of an entire population of, of millions of people? Millions of people, those crosses, well, you had all sorts of possibilities, didn't you? You had dominant versus dominant, homozygous versus heterozygous, and so forth. You have to put it all together and figure it out. Well, you can still can do genetics, but you have to change the way you think about it. You can't think about what were the ratios for an individual cross. What you need to think about is what is the uh, frequency of a particular allele in a population. And that's kind of a, a mind shift. So I might say, for example, that the, uh, the uh, percentage of people in a population who have blonde hair is only 10% is very, very small. Now, that doesn't mean that the ratio in a genetic cross was 90-10, 9 to 1. It doesn't mean that at all. It means that if, all, if you took all of the possible crosses that take place, the net result is that you would have a population which is only 10% blonde. Okay, so that's kind of our mind shift we need to make to talk about population genetics here. And what we'll find is that Mendel's laws still apply, but in a much bigger way. Okay, let's just look at a very simple example. Let's stick with my hair color here. So let's suppose that hair color is gene A. It isn't, but let's just suppose it is for purposes of a simple example. And let's say that dominant A would be dark hair colors, uh, black, brown, and so forth, and that uh, small A recessive would be light, blonde, red hair. Okay, let's just imagine in this population that the frequency of dominant A allele is 70%. Fair enough? So we're going to use a little terminology here. And we're going to say, if you just look right here, F frequency of A is 0.7. And 0.7 here, of course, means 70%. And if it's a simple system, one gene, two alleles, dominant recessive, that means that the frequency of the recessive allele, small a, would be 0.3. Got to add up to, to 1, right? 100%. But if those are the frequencies of the alleles in the population, what would we expect would be the phenotype frequencies in the entire population? Well, the guys who figured it out, two guys, Hardy, Weinberg, they came up with a very simple idea, which is really what the Punnett square is based on. So I know we're kind of working backwards on this the Hardy-Weinberg principle, and it says that allele frequencies always remain constant in a population from generation to generation, regardless of all the different types of crosses that you have. So if I had big A is 0.7 and little a is 0.3, from generation to generation, that will remain a constant. Now, there's a couple of conditions. Uh, we assume that there are no mutations taking place, and we assume that there's no migration in and out. We also assume that there's no selective pressure on the uh, allele, like weeding one out over time. Now, as a lot of biologists have, have pointed out, this, of course, is impossible. You can never have all these conditions missing. There's always going to be selective pressure. So Hardy-Weinberg, you know, doesn't, doesn't stay constant from generation to generation as, as, as it would in a perfect situation. But obviously, it can be used to track the changes uh, as the frequencies change. OK, we're not going to get into that. We just want to understand um, how to figure out phenotypes. So in their terminology, then, if you look right down here, they use letters little p and little q. Don't know why they picked those letters, but we'll stick with it. Little p would equal the frequency of one allele, let's say in this case, big A. And q, right over here, would be the frequency of the other allele um, small a. So therefore, if you look right down here, right, p plus q would have to equal 1. Got to be 
for everybody. Now, we could have systems with more than, more than two alleles, but we'll keep it simple. And here's what they said. Here's the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Very simple. It is p squared plus 2pq plus p squared equals 1. For those of you who know something about a binomial uh, distribution, that would be parentheses p plus q, close parentheses squared, would give us that equation. Now that tells us exactly what the phenotypes would be. Why is that? Well, this should look kind of familiar to you because this really is the Punnett square, right? So look down here. If you have p, and p times p would give p squared. And q times q would, of course, be a homozygous recessive q squared. And p times q, right, would give you these two guys who are the heterozygotes. Since there's two of them, it would be 2 PQ. So you can see that Hardy-Weinberg equation really is what set it up. So if you look at P squared, those are the dominant homozygotes. 2PQ would be the heterozygotes. And Q squared would be the amount of homozygous recessives. And that's really what was the basics for the Punnett square. Okay, let's go to the next screen here. Let's try an example. See if we can make sense of this. Suppose I already know that the frequency of a dominant allele A uh, is 0.7. Okay? What are the frequencies of genotypes and phenotypes in this population? Okay, let's stick with our hair color. Let's say big A was dark hair. So if it's 0.7, AA, the dominant homozygous, or P square in our Hardy Weinberg terminology, right? So we're down here, yeah? would be 0.7 times 0.7 equals 0.49. 49% of the population, then, are homozygous dominants. 2PQ, which are also going to be dark, remember, because big A wins out, would be 2 times 0.7 times 0.3. 0.3 is Q, which gives us 42%. And the homozygous lights, our blonde-haired kids, 0.3 times 0.3 are only... 0.909, oh excuse me, which is 9% of the population. Let's add them up then. So, how much of our population has dark hair? Well, the homozygous dominants who are 0.49, the heterozygous who are 0.42 would add up to be 0.91, which is 91% of the population. And therefore, since it has to add up to 100%, Q squared, 0.09, 9% of the population is light hair. So really all we're doing now is we're doing those Punnett squares again, but instead of doing single alleles, the genotypes from the gametes, we're doing frequencies for those guys to go and do a whole population. Let's move on here. Why is this so important? Well, it tells us a lot about why alleles who are not particularly good tend to last. And I'll give you a really great example, which is sickle cell anemia. SCA. Sickle cell anemia is what causes the uh, contortion of red blood cells because of the hemoglobin can no longer bind oxygen here. So if you look right up here, this is a normal uh, red blood cell, and here's what happens, of course, when you have a mutation that causes sickle cell, and it can't bind oxygen very, very bad, right? Okay. Uh, now, this is an autosomal recessive disease. And it's very interesting. It actually occurs because of a single point mutation in the hemoglobin gene, HBB, uh, one single thing. And uh, what it is is GAG, which is the normal codon, which codes for uh, amino acid called glutamine. This A right here changes to be a T. Because it changes to be a T, you get a new amino acid. Remember, we used that translation table there for the code. We get valine. And that enough is able to change it to a mutated hemoglobin, which is known not as A, but as hemoglobin S. And that gives this terrible shape for the red blood cell. Okay, so why does this fit into Hardy-Weinberg? Well, if this is such a terrible disease, I mean, and these people die from it, why doesn't this uh, allele get weeded out over time? All these people are dying. So SS the recessive homozygous, those people get sickle cell anemia and they die. Very terrible.
But the Hardy-Weinberg equation shows us that that allele can still survive in the heterozygote. Now that was AS. Now the S is there, but that person doesn't really get sickle cell anemia, do they? And so that allele survives there, even though the other guys are getting weeded out. And the Hardy-Weinberg equation says that frequency in the next generation will pop out again and form more uh, recessive homozygotes, even though most of them died last time. But there's more to it than that. And this is what's very, very tricky about sickle cell anemia. Okay, yeah, it causes sickle cell anemia, but it also gives resistance to malaria. And this occurs a lot in Africa, right? So Africans have a real problem with malaria and with sickle cell anemia at the same time. Now here's the trick. SS, okay. That's the homozygous recessive. Now, those guys are going to get uh, sickle cell anemia, but at the same time, they have a resistance to another disease, malaria. Okay, the guys who are heterozygous, AS, they don't really get uh, sickle cell anemia, but they do get a little resistance to malaria. And the guys who are the dominant, homozygous, and we would think, well, that's good, right? They're not going to get sickle cell anemia. Yeah, but they don't have any resistance malaria, and they could die from that. Let's put this all together, and you'll see how tricky this allele is, right? Remember nature's big plan. Nature's big plan is it wants you to reproduce and to pass on your genes. And once you've done that, it doesn't care about you anymore. Now, this makes perfect sense for this uh, hemoglobin allele. Check it out. SS. Those are the guys who get resistance malaria. And they survive, therefore, long enough to get to be in, you know, 20s, 30s. And they reproduce, and then they go ahead and they finally get sickle cell anemia and they die. But they've already reproduced because they had resistance to malaria. They didn't die when they were like 10 years old, did they? Now, the SA guys, right, they get some benefit, enough to make it worth their while also. So they also survive a little bit. And they uh, might not get malaria, and uh, that S allele survives. The other guys, though, AA, who you would think, well, that's great. They're not going to get sickle cell anemia. Yeah, but they could die when they're 10 years old from malaria. So by this way, the allele gives enough uh, protection against malaria so that you might live long enough to reproduce and pass on the allele. And so the allele then survives. Extremely tricky. The Hardy-Weinberg equation shows us then that by hiding in the heterozygote, uh, even an allele who's not that good can survive. Let's go ahead and just try a brief example of this so everyone understands what's going on. Um, suppose, let's just bring a screen down here. Suppose that you have 4% of an African population which is born with severe sickle cell anemia. In other words, they are SS, they are the homozygous recessive. Well, what percentage of the population, then, would you expect to be heterozygote? Okay, let's go through the numbers here using the Hardy-Weinberg equation. First of all, we know that the homozygous recessives, who Hardy-Weinberg says is Q squared, equals 0.04. That is 4% of the population. Therefore, Q would have to be 0.2. In other words, the frequency of the allele, big S, would be 20%. Who are the heterozygotes? They are PQ, but we know that there's two of them. So let's go ahead and do it. If Q is 0.2, they got to add up to 1, therefore P would be 0.8, 80% of the population. And who would 2PQ the heterozygotes be? 2 times 0.8 times 0.2, which is 0.32, which is 32% of the population. 